Matt Roper is a research associate at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute of Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University. Received a BA in History and MA in Sociology from BYU, and he has a long and abiding interest in the Book of Mormon. Is a published on many issues. I've always enjoyed reading Max, Matt's articles in many different publications. And with that short introduction, I'm going to turn the time over to Matt Roper. is on. I don't want to burn a hole through somebody's screen here. All right. In his account of the opening salvos of a bloody and costly war, Mormon, prophet historian of the Nephites, wrote, and the work of death commenced on both sides, but it was more dreadful on the part of the Lamanites, for their nakedness was exposed to the heavy blows of the Nephites with their swords and their scimitars, which brought death at almost every stroke. Swords and scimitars were only a part of the arsenal of weaponry used by peoples of the Book of Mormon, but they were a significant one. There we go. Today I'm going to talk about swords and scimitars in the Book of Mormon in light of what we can learn from Mesoamerican history, art, and archaeology. First, I will discuss steel swords in the Book of Mormon in the ancient Near East, including the Sword of Laban. Second, I will discuss pre-Columbian swords and scimitars, or curved swords, known from ancient Mexico and Central America. What did they look like? How effective were they? And how do they compare with descriptions of swords in the Book of Mormon? Finally, I'll, dis I'll discuss recently discovered evidence for these weapons during Book of Mormon times. In the ancient Near East, there were at least two kinds of swords, one for stabbing and another for striking or slashing. Here you can see some several different kinds. This one here. Okay. They don't have a picture on that side. All right. I'll do the best I can with what we got over here. Stabbing swords are sometimes called rapiers with pointed or straight blades of various lengths and could usually both stab and slash. A scimitar or a scimitar, it's the same word, uh, means the same thing, is a sword with a curved blade, usually on the convex or outward curving side, like this Egyptian example. Although examples of double-edged blades are also known. They were primarily used to cut or slash. Previous to the development of steel technology in the ancient Near East, Bronze blades were commonly used, but were not very long. After the 10th century BC and the development, I had to point it right here. Is that better? All right. After the 10th century BC uh, and the de development of steel technology, it became possible to make longer, durable uh, blades although surviving examples from the Iron Age are very rare. Here we go back a little bit. One of the earliest criticisms of the Book of Mormon was that Laban could not have had a steel sword blade. Here, E.D. Howe, sometimes called the granddaddy of anti-Mormons, published the first anti-Mormon book in, in Ohio in 1834. This is the earliest account of steel to be found in history, he says with some derision. Um, another example, Clark Braden, in the 1880s, Laban's sword was steel when it is a notorious fact that the Israelites knew nothing of steel for hundreds of years afterward. Who but as ignorant a person as Rigdon would have perpetrated all these blunders? The Book of Mormon, however, has since been shown to be correct in this. About 30 years ago, Israeli archaeologists discovered a meter-long sword of steel near the site of Jericho, dating to the time of King Josiah, Laban's contemporary, which is now on display at a museum in Jerusalem, which you can see here. Here's a picture. This is Bruce Chadwick's picture of this meter-long sword. The, um, the caption there next to the sword 
says, this rare and exceptional long sword, which was discovered on the floor of a building next to the skeleton of a man, dates to the end of the first temple period. That's the time of Nephi, okay? The sword is 1.05 meters long, has a double-edged blade with a prominent central ridge running along its entire length. The hilt was originally inlaid with material that has not survived, most probably wood. Only the nails that once secured the inlays to the hilt can be seen, and owing to the length and weight of the sword, it was probably necessary to hold it with two hands. The sword is made of iron hardened into steel, attesting to substantial metallurgical knowledge. Over the years, it's become cracked due to corrosion. Okay? So, bullseye for the Book of Mormon. Now, were all Book of Mormon swords made of steel? That's a question we want to talk about. Pre-Columbian America, let me state from the outset that no metal sword blades of any kind have been, have been found so far from pre-Columbian times, including steel ones. So let's just say that, from the op say that from the output. As one who reads the Book of Mormon and accepts it for what it purports to be, I want to consider what that, why that might be the case. I also want to look at what the Book of Mormon actually says and not what we've sometimes assumed it to say. I also want to see if historical and archaeological information can help me understand the nature of things as well. The earliest, um, and in fact the only explicit reference to steel among the Jaredites, is early on with Prince Shul, who's described as mighty in judgment, which means he was a sharp fellow. Okay. He made swords of steel, okay, and um, he uses these to deliver his family from, from captivity. The text doesn't, it, it makes it clear that this was something that Shul knew about, that he was able to do. It doesn't say anything about how or if he passed on that technology, although that's possible. Okay. It's interesting, however, that the next generation after Shul, um, Jaredites are nearly all wiped out. There's no further mention of steel, in fact, in the Book of Ether after that time. That could suggest that steel swords were relatively rare, or perhaps that steel technology among the Jaredites was subsequently lost in periods of social anarchy, which the book talks about. Now, there's another passage that might have bearing on, on this idea. Um, King Limhi's search party, here's a picture from George Ottinger, of Limhi's search party. Um, uh, this search party found ruins of buildings and bones of the Jaredites along with the 24 gold plates of ether. And also, they have brought breastplates which are very large and they are of brass and of copper and are perfectly sound. And again, they have brought swords. The hilts thereof have perished and the blades thereof were cankered with rust. Now, we're not told if these particular blades were rusted steel or some other metal, such as bronze, which can also corrode. Uh, there was no word for bronze cancroid in Joseph Smith's day, so rust would, would work. In any case, these things were brought back for a testimony that the things they had said are true. Another indication that perhaps by Limhi's day, swords with metal blades may have been unusual or rare. Now let's talk about Laban's sword. After separation from the Nephites, Nephi states, uh, separation from the Lamanites, excuse me, Nephi states that he did take the sword of Laban, and after the manner of it, did make swords, lest by any means the people who are now called Lamanites should come upon us to destroy us. What does this mean when he says he made swords after the manner of the sword of Laban? Another, uh, one possibility is that, of course, that he made other steel swords. Um, that's possible. Uh, another possibility is that he made some swords after the general pattern of Laban's sword, perhaps a long straight shaft with sharp blades along the edges rather than a curved sickle sword that was bladed only on one side. Writing years later, Nephi describes Laban's blade as made of most precious steel, suggesting that there was more than one kind and that some with which he was familiar was considered less precious. There are early references to Nephite steel, and then there are two references to, there's a reference to fine steel 
and Laban's blade of most precious steel, which are from objects that were made in the old world, not the new. So perhaps the terms, uh, the different terms reflect different grades of technological skill that Nephi knew about. It's possible Nephi and some early Nephites were able to make other steel swords, but it's also possible that while they were able to work carburized iron, which is an early form of steel, for ornamentation purposes, they were unable to master other stealing techniques such as tempering, which were needed to make long, effective steel blades. So there's different kinds of steel there. But let's just assume for today that Nephi made some steel swords. How many did he make? Well, we're not told. After the death of Nephi, how many people possessed the steel technology that he knew about? Did all Nephites know how to work steel or just some? As with many other cultures, relevant metallurgical knowledge may have been restricted to a few individuals or artisans and could have been lost in just one Lamanite raid. The last reference to steel among the Nephites is during the time of Jacob's grandson, Jerem, and is never again mentioned among the Nephites. When the Xenophites return to the land of Nephi a few generations after this, they know about iron and other metals, but significantly not steel. This, incidentally, is also the last reference to working iron among the Nephites. It was apparently an exceptional thing for Nephi or Benjamin to wield the sword of Laban in defense of their people. All this suggests to me, as I read the Book of Mormon, that steel swords were probably the exception, not the norm, and that among the people of the Book of Mormon, metal blades were a rare or an elite item, the exception rather than the norm, and would tend to be carefully preserved. If that's the case, then other kinds of swords may have been adequate for their needs. Historical accounts, Mesoamerican art, and anthropological sources show that there were, there were a variety of sword and sword-like weapons in pre-Columbian times. These include sharp wooded blades, sharp wooded blades of hard wood, and one or two-handed swords with blades of obsidian, flint, and sometimes even shark teeth, and a cutlass or curved weapon with obsidian or flint blades. Swords with sharp hardwood blades were in fact known throughout North and South America in pre-Columbian times, including Mesoamerica. In fact, today's steel-bladed machete is believed by some anthropologists to be the functional equivalent of a certain agricultural tool from pre-Columbian times. Uh, one scholar, Hayden, has suggested that in Highland Guatemala, a sharp-bladed heavy piece of hardwood may have been employed anciently for cutting down or wringing scrub and secondary growth, which is today cleared with a machete. People in that region, he says, before World War II, when metal implements were scarce and expensive, used tools called palo machetes or wooden machetes to clear scrub and growth from the fields. These were made of hardwoods. Clemency Coggins, a specialist in Mayan civilization, believes that the modern machete is a direct descendant of the wooden sickle-like tools, for example, like these preserved um, in a cenote of a well at Chichen Itza, in the Yucatan. These are, as you can see, a curved wood piece with a sharpened curve edge. The tip's been broken off, but these were used in the field to, to clear scrubs, and they were, they were relatively sharp. He observes that such a tool might also serve for defense against predators, snakes, and strangers while in the field. Consequently, the agricultural tool and the weapon may have been one and the same. Sometime around 200 BC, Zenith recorded that his people were attacked by the Lamanites while they were feeding their flocks and tilling their lands. When the survivors fled to the king, he had to arm them quickly. Thus I did arm them with bows and with arrows and swords and scimitars and with clubs and with slings and all manner of weapons which we could invent. Nothing is said about what materials were used to make these arms, but given the emergency situation, it's plausible that they used whatever they had at hand, including tools that they were using in the field where they were attacked. Since the Lamanites were without armor at this time, even such relatively crude weapons could have been effective. Now, perhaps the best known, perhaps the best known uh, sword and weapon uh, known to the Aztecs was the Maquitl. At least this is the one that today we, most people will know about when we talk about swords. This weapon consisted of a long, flat piece of hardwood with grooves along the side into which were set and glued sharp fragments of obsidian or flint. 
Several inches of the wood piece were usually left as a hand grip at the bottom, and the rest of the instrument had a sharp, bladed edge along both sides. Martial art from Mesoamerica suggests a variety of blade forms, including staggered blades, and we'll see some pictures of these in a minute, pointed and continuous blades. Sources also indicate that these swords varied in length, anywhere from 50 centimeters, 19.7 inches long, to over five feet in length. The longer and heavier weapon had to be wielded with both hands. According to one Spanish source, the Aztec broadswords had their hilts not quite so long as those of Spanish swords and three fingers wide. Ross Hassig notes some swords had thongs through which the user could put his hand to secure the weapon in battle as he grasped the hilt. Martial art frequently shows the hilt of this weapon with a knob at the end, which would obviously help keep the weapon from slipping out of the user's hand in combat. 20 years ago, I wrote an article citing historical, mostly first-hand sources, describing these Aztec weapons as swords. Some had questioned whether you can call them sword. Well, they're swords. Additionally, most historians of Mesoamerican weapons consider it a sword, and some writers have spoken of this weapon as, although some writers have spoken of this weapon as a war club, the term club is not really apt. The weapon spoken of was designed to slash and to cut rather than to crush as a club would. In fact, eyewitness accounts not only describe it as a sword, but distinguish it from clubs. The Aztec word applied to this weapon was maquitl. Another word sometimes used by historians was a Caribo, was a, excuse me, a Taino word, makana refers usually to the same thing. The Maya had their own word for this weapon, hatsab, which means that with which one strikes a blow. It's interesting to compare this to the Hebrew word for cut, hatsab, in Isaiah 51.9, where the prophet speaks of the Lord cutting the cosmic enemy. Some historians have occasionally applied terms such as makana and maquitl to other obsidian bladed weapons that would not qualify as swords. This means that one has to be careful not to assume that all references to a maquitl or a makana in the literature refer to swords. It's clear, however, that many of them were swords, and they have a long history in Mesoamerican warfare. So let's have some show and tell here and see what some of these were like. Here is just, these are just from some different Mesoamerican codices. You can see the separated blade here held in the hand. Now, you can't always tell. Sometimes they're just shown with three blades. Sometimes they're shown with as many as 10 blades on the side. It indicates there's probably was some variation in, in how long, how many blades they had, and so forth. Here you can see some additional pictures here. So they're burning a temple and holding an aquedal in, in their other hand. Here we've got a little bit longer version. You can see it's taller than the one in the previous picture. These are uh, all from Diego Duran. Um, guy on the boat doesn't look like he's, he looks like he's in trouble. Um, there is some additional ones here. All these are separated blades, you'll note, along the, along the side. Now, some of them had pointed blade edges, and they look, had kind of a more serrated look. And uh, you probably wouldn't want to go up against somebody who has a weapon like that. Um, so you, again, these are again pointed edges. Some of them were longer than others again. Now note here, in other representations, sometimes in the same codices, you have a different form that shows almost a continuing, continuous edge of the obsidian. Um, and that's what you have here, if you look. Instead of the separated edge, you have a, kind of a continuous edge that of the sharp obsidian blades that could cut right through you, okay? So I'll give you an idea. Again, these are all continuous blades. All right, um, now, how sharp were they? Obsidian blades like the Aztec Maquitl were very sharp. One common claim of Spanish histories is that the Aztec sword could cut off the head of a horse with one blow. Most of these accounts, however, are not from first-hand sources. First-hand accounts do relate several times when horses were easily killed with such weapons. And uh, there are a number of accounts here. Um, they talk about killing the horses and the sword thrust in the neck laid the horse at his feet. Um, 
The closest we get to getting a horse head cut off with one blow of a maquetal is from this last reference. Well, um, they capture the horse and uh, nearly kill the rider. They seize his lance so he could not use it, and others slashed at him, uh, wounding him severely, and they slashed at his mare, cutting her head at the neck so that it hung by the skin. The mare fell dead. Um, now, this account suggests that the rider's horse may have been struck by more than one blow. It's possible the weapon involved may have been also the heavier, much longer two-handed weapon rather than the shorter sword that we see in some pictures. And the blow was probably a heavy downward stroke. Book of Mormon swords were obviously very sharp. We notice here several references to this in the Book of Mormon where they smite off many of the arms. Uh, of the warriors in their anger. The naked skins of the Lamanites are exposed to the sharp swords of the Nephites. Of course, the Count of Coriantum are getting, losing his head about the situation um, are all pretty well, well known to you. Now, abundant evidence from Mesoamerican art and historical sources attest to the deadly effectiveness of these swords against human opponents. The brutal nature, notes one authority, of this weapon made co combat bloody and dismemberment common. Spaniards who faced native Mesoamerican swords in battle were deeply impressed by their deadly cutting power and razor-like sharpness. Following the conquest of the city of Azcapotzalco by the Aztecs, here we go back a little bit, um, the neighboring ruler of Coyacan tried to persuade the city to rebel against their new overlords. In response, the recently defeated ruler dismissed the idea as extreme folly. Are we to see the streets of our city again bathed in blood, covered with entrails, with arms and heads and severed legs? In a subsequent notorious event, an Aztec messenger was killed after delivering a formal declaration of war to the ruler of Tlatelolco. While he yet spoke, Tecanal appeared, sword in hand, and with one blow cut off Kuyatsin's head. This head was then carried to the boundaries of Tenochtitlan, where it was thrown. After that, the Tlatelolco set up a great howling, calling, Tlatelolco, Tlatelolco, and bad things happened after that. The Codex Azcatitlan portrays the gruesome aftermath of the conflict that subsequently ensued. Here you can see the dismembered remains of some of the dead. Um, you see the guy on the pyramid there. Now, other codices also portray the deadly neck, uh, nature of Maquetal sword blades. Um, here's from another Central Mexican codex. You can see there's a warrior underneath him or four other defeated lords, two of them who've been decapitated. Um, here's another one from the Codex Azcatitlan of uh, dismemberment. And uh, here's another portraying an early Aztec battle. I hope you don't use or lose your lunch today, brothers and sisters. Um, this was a spy, they're, they're showing what happens to a spy if they're captured by the uh, people in Mexico City there. Again, they were quite deadly. Now, one area that's little explored is the examination of extant human remains from, from conflict and warfare. What you see here are some human bones from an Aztec site which one recent scholar suggests have been uh, cut by a severing instrument, possibly a maquetal. Modern experiments on animal carcasses, none have been done on human remains for obvious legal and ethical reasons, suggest that there would have been considerable chipping of the blades in the course of battle. So, as one scholar puts it, we should consider the damage that would be done when even one of the blades impacted on a limb and cut through to the bone embedding microflakes of obsidian, prohibiting healing and causing infection. While obsidian sword blades were deadly and effective, they could also be fragile. Consequently, as Ross Hassig explains, warriors probably made some effort to avoid direct blows to the blades. They may have used the flat of the weapon to parry and have struck with bladed, the bladed edges, but they were more likely to have deflected the blows with the shield because parrying damaged their weapon and meant losing the initiative and opportunity to strike back. Thus, maquetal duels are unlikely to have resembled European saber duels in which combat struck and parried with the same weapon. 
You're not going to see a Zorro duel uh, in Mesoamerica. They fought a little bit differently. In the course of battle, the blades would ship and break and need to be replaced. Stone blades shatter, notes Hasig, when they strike other weapons, but they usually do not when they strike cotton armor, flesh, or shields. Uh, another thing they found in experiments is that sometimes it'll, one of the places it will break is when it goes through the heavier bones and then you get little chips that get embedded in the bone. While weapons with shattered blades can still be used effectively as clubs, their effectiveness is impaired. This peri thus, the periodic withdrawal of troops during combat served not only to rest the men, but also to allow them to trade weapons. Overnight, after battles, blades were probably replaced and other arms were repaired. Historical sources suggest that McQuedal swords could vary in quality as well as form. While some sources indicate Aztec blades would begin to chip and break after only a few blows, other testimony from eyewitnesses affirms that blades were so set in some cases that one could neither break them nor pull them out. Now let's talk about King Anti-Nephi-Lehi and the Lamanites who are converted. Um, their king comes to them. They've, uh, they've lived the lifestyle in, uh, saturated with warfare and the concept of warfare central to everything that they're doing. And so the king gathers his, the converted people together and this is what he says. I also thank my God, yea, my great God, he hath granted unto us that we might repent of these things and also that he hath forgiven us of our many sins and murders which we have committed and taken away the guilt from our hearts through the merits of his son. And now behold my brethren, since it has been all we could do as we were the most lost of mankind to repent of all of our sins and to get God to take them away from our hearts, for it was all we could do to repent sufficiently before God that he would take away our stain. Now, since God hath taken away our stains and our swords hath become bright, then let us stain our swords no more with the blood of our brethren. Let us retain our swords that they be not stained with the blood of our brethren, for perhaps, if we should stain our swords again, they can no more be washed bright through the blood of the Son of our great God, which shall be shed for the atonement of our sins. Oh, how merciful is our God! And behold, since it has been as much as we could do to get our stains taken away from us and our swords made bright, let us hide them away that they may be kept bright as a testimony to our God at the last day or at the day that we shall be brought to stand before him to be judged, that we have not stained our swords in the blood of our brethren. And he goes on and they they hid these things away so that the swords were kept right. Now, let's think about this for just a minute and put yourself uh, in the ancient world, in ancient pre-Columbian Mesoamerica. Now, a steel blade can be easily wiped off after a battle, but a McQuedal sword becomes stained as the blood shed during combat seeps into the wooden base. Following battle, the soldier warrior would replace the chipped and damaged obsidian blades with new ones. They do that after each battle. But the hard wooden piece into which they were set lasts much longer and would be used again and again, each time soaking up more blood unless it becomes broken and also needs replacement. Now, think about this. How do you remove blood from a blood-soaked wooden weapon in the ancient world? Well, you can't. Swords stained with blood mirror human hearts and consciences stained with sin and guilt in the metaphor the king of the Lamanites is using. So we have a powerful metaphor emphasizing the profound power and mercy of God in taking away the sins and guilt through his own atoning blood. Now, what about the idea of brightness? Many types of obsidian have a fine luster so that the edges of, a, of McQuedal swords when reflected upon by sunlight might well be described as bright or brilliant and some of the sources do just that. Having learned of the gospel of Jesus Christ, having believed it, these converts repented of all their sins and are made clean. Freed from guilt and shame, they obtain a hope as bright as the light which once reflected upon their sword blades. So while the metaphor is understandable with steel blades, I think it'd be especially meaningful and profound, perhaps more so in a cultural context of Mesoamerican warfare and weapons. Now, some people ask, well, why don't we find any Nephite swords? 
There were probably, and this is a conservative estimate, tens of thousands of these swords just in Aztec times, a very late period in pre-Columbian history. Let me ask you a question. How many examples of Aztec swords have survived until today? Just think about that. I know of only one published, documented example, and it's a definite maybe, okay? Because only the obsidian remains. Let's note what a few authorities on warfare in the old world and uh, in the new world talk about. Um, Venkel is an authority on old world warfare. Uh, specialized weapons, remember, sort of Laban would have been a specialized weapon uh, of sorts, very prized, often represented objects of such social significance that they are only rarely found in original archaeological contexts. Only disposable weapons were buried in graves. Specialized weapons were left only exceptionally in settlements or on battlefields. All these factors jointly lower the frequency in extreme cases to zero of weapons in archaeological data, which undoubtedly result in consequences for the evaluation of the character and development of societies and cultures. They affect how we perceive ancient warfare and what people did, because you don't find very many of these weapons. The volume of weaponry that's perished is impossible to quantify. Um, speaking again of the old world, one should recognize that the ver that very few items of ancient steel or semi-steel are known, though doubtless many are in archaeological dumps, rusted beyond visual or chemical recognition. Uh, David Webster, he's a Mayan archaeologist, identifiable weaponry is seldom if ever recovered in Maya graves, but only the lost durable parts, stone blades, would be recoverable in any case. And these would be difficult to distinguish between other tools and ritual objects. There are no known surviving examples of the Maquidal, notes Ross Hassig, an eminent authority on Mesoamerican warfare. Um, cite another scholar in the same field, if it was just from Mexica archaeological evidence alone, we might think that this weapon, the Maquidal, was hardly used by this people. Very few archaeological objects have been recovered. In fact, he says more in a very recent book, remains of the Maquidal are practically non-existent. Hey, think about that. We're just talking about a very latest period of pre-Columbian history, the Aztecs. Tens of thousands of these weapons, and we only know of one verified archaeological example that survived, maybe. So that's something to keep in mind as you, as you ponder what we think should survive or what hasn't survived. Let's talk a little bit about scimitars. Um, scimitar is just a curved sword. Uh, in the old world, you have scimitars mainly curved on the convex or outward curving side of the blade. But in some cases, uh, it was bladed on both sides. Ross Hassig identifies a curved weapon in some Toltec mon monuments as uh, he gives it the term a short sword. Okay? And uh, he talks a little bit about this. He says it was lighter and carried more cutting surface than, uh, than say, an ax. Um, each blade was backed by a wooden base that provided direct support. It was an excellent slasher, and yet the forward curve of the sword retained some of the aspects of a crusher when used curved end forward. So they'd have a curved weapon here, and they would bring it down like you would with a McQuedal, except it's, it's got a curve on it. Um, shorter than spears, lighter than clubs. It was considerably more mobile. Um, he sees it's, uh, it allowed the warriors, a uh, single warrior, to carry a short sword, a projectile, like a atlatl and darts, a knife and shield supported by an arm strap instead of dividing their forces. Soldiers could now provide their own covering fire with atlatls while they advanced and still engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat with short swords once they closed with the enemy. So it was a real military advantage, he says, to be able to have a short sword in addition to your other weapons that you would use from a distance as you close in with the enemy. Now, here's some examples. Now, there's different theories about where this weapon developed and when it developed. Hasek thinks it was a relatively late development that maybe uh, came out of North American uh, war clubs, like this one that you see from an Ohio museum that we visited recently. Um, in Mesoamerica, what they would do is they would take uh, they take sharp pieces of obsidian and inset them into the end of this as they would with a McQuedal, but on the curved blade. 
Um, here is an example from uh, the Borgia Codex, a person standing there with, with a curved sword, or a scimitar, as I consider it. Um, here's another example. I see the curved weapon there. Note that it's sort of pointed at the end, too. Um, the red antler-looking thing sticking out of the weapon is a symbol for blood that's dripping from the blades and the, this codice. Here are some other examples that are tipped. Um, that's obsidian on the end. Now, this is at Tula. This is a curved weapon. Um, again, is Hasek's short sword. This is all post-classic, so this is... Um, this is still pretty late, before Aztecs, but, but not too long before. Here you've got a comparison. Here's a Near Eastern scimitar next to a Mesoamerican curved short sword. Now, uh, in Alma 44, you have uh, the battle with the Nephites and the Zoramites, and you have the Zoramite leader delivers up his weapons, and what does he have? He, uh, he delivers up a bow, he has a sword and a scimitar, and gives them to General Moroni. Well, some people have wondered, uh, you know, why does he need, why does he need a, a sword and a scimitar? He, um, if you look in the Old Testament, you'll see the description of Goliath. Goliath actually has several weapons. He's got this big spear that he has, but then he has a herab, or a sword, has a sheath, and then they say that he has a kedon, which he carries between his shoulders. Now, a lot of times in some of the older translations of the Bible, they'll say, well, kedon was, uh, was like a javelin or, or something. But with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, most biblical scholars have concluded that a kedon was a scimitar. It was a sickle sword or a, or a curved, curved weapon. So what David talks to his opponent, he says, you come against me with a sword and spear and scimitar, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. So Goliath has both of these weapons. Now, they need not have been carried or wielded simultaneously. As with Goliath, one or more weapons that Zerahemna uh, Zere turns over to Moroni may have been carried into battle by a guard or a servant during battle. Hasek notes again that the curved short sword was lighter and may have been useful to have as a secondary lighter blade after Makana sword blades became chipped or worn during the course of battle. So there are a number of reasons why he'd have both. Now, could Mesoamerican swords have been used to pierce an enemy? This is a good question. During one battle, unarmored Lamanites were exposed to the sharp swords of the Nephites. The Nephite soldier takes up the scalp of Zemnariha lays it upon the point of his sword. These passages suggest that some Nephite swords had the ability to pierce and that some were also pointed. Most passages, however, speak of using swords to cut. The dissenter Coriantumr attempts to cut his way through with the sword. By far the most common verb, though, in the Book of Mormon in reference to swords is the word smite or its derivatives. Some of these refer to cutting off, or to cutting as when Ammon smote off the arms of his enemies with the edge of the sword. The Lamanites, during one particularly fierce encounter, smote off many of the arms of the Nephites. Coriantumr smote off the head of Shiz. So you have this word that's being used. This incidentally, um, this frequency of textual references leads us to conclude that while some Book of Mormon swords were pointed, most may not have been, but were more often used to slash or cut. This incidentally agrees with pre-exilic Israelite practice. Biblical scholar T.R. Hobbes concluded based on textual references that the Israelites favored the slashing sword designed with one or two edges and that few rapiers or thrusting swords have been discovered from the Iron Age Israel, although they had some. Whereas many more slashing swords or cutlasses of various kinds have been found. Meshtek codices show two similar bladed weapons wielded by warriors which scholars consider and have called makanas. One of these has a long pole-like handle and resembles a spear or a lance. You can see some examples here. Note that they're stabbing with the lance as they're approaching the opponent. A similar weapon is also shown which has a much shorter blade and is likely a, a sword. Here you can see this one. Note how he's holding it differently in the, in the picture there. 
The bladed portion of the shorter weapon exactly resembles the longer spear which was used to pierce or slash. This suggests that the sword represented could likewise be used to pierce an opponent when needed. Murals from the Temple of Warriors at Chichen Itza, for example, show that these could sometimes be wielded with the sharpened end forward or using the tip to do human sacrifice and heart extraction. Um, here's a pointed Aztec weapon, which Ross Hassig uh, considers a sword. Note that he says that there's actually two types here of two Aztec nobles who are, one is pointed, one has the, the pointed edges and one has the separated edges there. So you do have some swords in Aztec times that were apparently pointed and are different than clubs. Um, here's another one from the Book of Mormon times, the pre-classic period of Lultun Cave. Now some people have said, well, this isn't really a, a McQuedal-like weapon, it's, maybe it's a club, but you really can't tell because you're, we're looking at it uh, the way that we are. But it certainly is similar to the one that, uh, somewhat similar you can see there, one that Hasek talks about, even though there's a, two different art forms, so it may just be a club. But, um, here again is human sacrifice using this curved weapon. Um, note the pointed part of the weapon on the Tula pillar here, which is, so you got pointed scimitars on each of these. This is from the Mapa Teozocuaco. Um, notice some of these are pointed. So yeah, most weapons probably were not pointed most of them were used to slash or cut, but some of them appear to have been pointed and could be used to thrust. This is down on the Pacific coast of Guatemala on a monument. Notice this weapon, which is likely a, a McQuedal-like sword. Uh, again, this is after Book of Mormon time, so it's much later, but you know, the point there. So let me just close here, talk a little bit about Book of Mormon times. Are there any... Are there any of these weapons in Book of Mormon times? Yeah, most scholars who you talk to, uh, who talk about Mesoamerican warrior, think that the McQuedal, and Ross Hassig calls this short sword or symmetry, would be fairly late developments, going only back to maybe, a thousand, maybe to about 1000 AD or so. Um, now, I think that there are good reasons to question that assumption. Mesoamerican art dating to the classic period shows that swords had a much longer history. A figurine from Palenque, uh, Mexico, here you have a, a warrior figure with a shield and he's holding a maquedal with the uh, pointed downward. You can't completely see this, but if you turn the picture around a bit, you can see that there are actually, it's actually the blades, note the pointed blades in later examples like you see in later examples, but here, if you look closely, you can see it's bladed on both sides there, very similar to some of the pointed ones you see in later Aztec art. Okay, here is another one. This is again La Nueva. We've talked about that. Now, this is interesting. This is Teotihuacan, um, about 450 to 650 AD. Here, we've got... Um, We've got scholars who uh, were working at, at the site uh, there known as Zone 11. It's called El Gran Conjunto. And they believe that they've identified several weapons on these damaged murals at the site. This is mural one in Portico three, and it shows two weapons with sharp saw-like edges of triangular blades directly above two rounded shields, leading the archeologist Ruben Cabrera to conclude these figures represent two macanas or military weapons. More recently, another specialist, uh, speaking of the same representation, agreed the object represented, quote, weapons that have cutting blades of wooden swords similar to the McQuedal, something that should not really be surprising since Tiwakanos were experts in the use of obsidian. Curved scimitar-like weapons are also shown in classic Mesoamerican art. And again, we're still, this is all still post Book of Mormon. Here's a, a weapon that scholars published and even notes it's called it a scimitar-like flint blade dating to about, the representation dates to about six, 600 uh, AD. Um, there's a figure here, and this is in a museum down in Campeche, 
You have a, a man with a death mask, he has a curved weapon of some kind about to decapitate an unhappy victim. Some have said this is an ax. With the curved nature of the weapon, it could possibly be a scimitar or a curved knife of some kind. Um, again, at Teotihuacan, here's a warrior is portrayed, note the curved knife that has a human heart impaled on it. Um, nasty piece of work. Here's another one, looks more, a little more like a grappling hook, um, with the same representation. Now, there's still earlier evidence that dates to the time of the Book of Mormon. Here again, we have this warrior at Voltun Cave who holds these two weapons we've mentioned. Note now the curved weapon in his left hand. Um, scholars of express some puzzlement about what exactly this is. The best guess is that it's some kind of a curved knife. And uh, those who've written about it um, have compared it to this weapon at Kaminal Huyu, which dates to about 150 BC. Note the weapon in the hand that he's holding out in front. It has kind of a curved on the end, but also a curved on the weapon on the bottom. And you look a little bit closer, you can almost see the edges from the the cutting portion. Um, Bill Hamlin, I think, was the first one to suggest that this may be some kind of a double dagger uh, weapon similar to what you see in ancient Syria or in India, known as a, a holiday. Um, note how it kind of curves in opposite directions here. Here's another one, um, give you an example. You see some of these in India, as well as Syria and some of the museums there. Okay, now this is down on the Pacific coast again at Isapa. Again, these are all uh, monuments that date to Book of Mormon times. Um, Isapa, here you note know, the warrior holding the curved instrument. Some have said this is some kind of curved knife and have compared it to the, the wood machetes that we've talked about earlier. They could have been obsidian bladed, it just may be portrayed that way. Here's another example, another curved weapon here could be a scimitar. Now, uh, these are Zapa La Venta on the opposite side up by the Gulf of Mexico. Note the warrior is holding this curved thing in his hand and, and some scholars have suggested that it has, there's obsidian blades there on the, on the curved edge. But this is the most interesting one I wanted to share before I close here. And uh, I think this one was kind of nifty. The pre-classic Olmec site of San Lorenzo in southern Veracruz has some interesting monuments. There are several here, Ann Cyphers, who is the lead archaeologist, or has been the lead archaeologist down there for many years. Note here, she's, they discovered these several monuments that have weapons portrayed on them. Okay, San Lorenzo dates to about 1200 BC, maybe a little bit earlier, and then down about 900 BC. So this would have been Jaredite times. In fact, some Latter-day Saint scholars have, like Brant Gardner and, and uh, John Sorensen and others, have suggested that there may be a connection between the Olmecs and the Jaredites. So here you've got, note the hilts or the handle of this, this weapon here. Here's another picture of it. And the monuments are damaged. Here's another one. You can't see that one very well. But uh, Ann Cyphers, Notes that on this monument here, Monument 78, she says that it shows two makanas, okay, so two basically sword weapons that are embedded with obsidian into the sides. One of them is a straight weapon that you see on the left, and the other one is curved, but part of the monument's broken here. Here's a drawing or a tracing that they've done on the one, the one you can see a little bit better. You've got a handle, you've got a straight shaft, with these triangular points on the side, and note the one that's curved on, right next to it. Uh, here's another monument. This is, that's another one, same one we just saw. Here is, uh, this is, this one is another curved one on Monument 91, and it has uh, 13 triangular flints, and note it's also pointed at the end. And these were just discovered in the last 20 years or so. And they date to Olmec time. So what they suggest is that you had 
Maquetal-like sword weapons that date all the way back to the uh, Olmec times, to what would be Jaredite times in the Book of Mormon, in addition to a curved weapon or scimitar which dates back to, to that time. So you have swords and scimitars that date all the way back and have been recognized recently by scholars as, as suggesting that. So I just wanted to, to share that with you and I will stop right there so we have time for questions. You know, the great thing about this is you can, uh, you don't see what I see, so I can make up whatever answers I want to whatever questions. Um, pref, do I have a preference on the spelling, scimitar or scimitar? Okay, scimitar, they both, are, they refer to the same thing. It means a curved sword, okay? And it, the earliest uses they used it to refer to the Muslim swords that were, that were curved. But the, there are Hebrew words for scimitar that go to go way back. And uh, the modern use, we'd say scimitar, but Book of Mormon uses a, an antiquated spelling of that. So maybe Royal Skousen could inform us on, on that a little bit better. Um, why do we not see metal or steel swords in Mesoamerican art? That's a good question. The question I have is, if you saw a steel sword in Mesoamerican art, how would you recognize it? They don't, there are some representations of Maquetal that don't even show the blades, they just show them holding the weapon. So if you did find it, how would you find it? Now, one of the things that I, the approach that I take to the Book of Mormon references to steel swords is yes, they had some steel swords, but they were rare and relatively uh, not that widespread. Uh, I say that for a number of reasons that I won't go into, but one big reason is there aren't that many references to steel in the Book of Mormon, and there are no references to steel among the Nephites after the first couple generations. So I think that it's reasonable in light of, uh, in the absence of further information, to, to read that as suggesting that, yeah, they had a few, and most have not survived. Now, we're not gonna find the Sword of Laban because that was hidden up. There may have been other things like things that Limhi's search party found that maybe they kept safe as well. So you're not gonna find that many. So one of the problems is, is, is how you're gonna recognize it in art anyway. Um, I read something recently, some scholars were saying that some of the, the monuments, the Mesoamerican monuments, originally were painted. Um, it'd be interesting to see some of those if you, if you had, if, if you could, if they portrayed weapons that were painted, perhaps that might indicate something about them, but I haven't, seen any of those. Um, let's see. Thin edge, sharp obsidian pieces are translucent and in light would appear bright. That's right. That's all I got. Um, let me just make one final comment as Scott comes up here to ring me off the stage. Um, I, had a, I had a great guy that came by my office a number of years ago and and uh, he was really into this, this thing, and he didn't know about the, the curved swords, but, but he had actually made his own Maquetal sword. And he had pieces of glass that he put into the side of it, and it was about this tall, and, and he brought it into the office to show me. And, and I said, oh, wow. I mean, uh, he says, where do you keep that thing? Oh, I just set it in my kitchen here. He, I go, are you married? He says, yeah, we got married this last year. I said, well. Don't make her angry. Um, I was, uh, it, it's pretty dangerous. And uh, Someone asked me if I, why I didn't have any props today. And I told him that the Department of Homeland Security confiscated and uh, wouldn't let me use them today. So um, besides, I didn't know if you'd like what I had to say and I wouldn't want you to use them against, against me. So anyway, thank you for listening.